Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Scott Cuthbert. I am an applied kinesiology chiropractor who is profoundly influenced by SOT. Uh, I began my study years ago with Dr. Vern Hagen in Palmer, Iowa, and then I worked with Cleo Bloodworth in Ireland. I was going to buy his practice. It didn't work out, but I've done SOT for years, and applied kinesiology just happens to be uh, something I've done for the last 15 years. And I want to present uh, what we call a clinical prediction rule possibility for the presence of cranial malfunctions in patients as well as headache. Is there a physical test that can be used by chiropractors to determine the presence of a cranial fault, which we all know is extraordinarily important to uh, our patients, especially patients who have head, neck, jaw disorders. Oops. So a clinical prediction rule seeks to identify the combination of biomedical signs, symptoms, and other findings that predict the probability of a specific condition or outcome of treatment. I'm proposing in this paper that it may be that the manual muscle test is a clinical prediction rule for cranial dysfunction. Um, in general, uh, it seems to be the uh, manual medical sciences are shifting away from structural pathology, diagnosing a specific joint that needs repair, and shifting instead towards the identification of clinical factors that indicate a favorable response for treatment. So studies that focus on predictive factors related to a specific diagnosis are, di are known as diagnostic clinical prediction rules. Uh, clinical prediction rules that are designed to predict an outcome of treatment, such as a success or failure, are considered prognostic clinical prediction rules. CPRs that are designed to target the most effective interventions are, are identified as prescripted, but these require prospective, longitudinal, randomized, controlled clinical trials that compare outcomes of treatment. I haven't got that kind of paper here, but I do feel like one is possibly in order. So a proposed clinical prediction rule for patients with headache and cranial dysfunction. In applied kinesiology, we find that patients with headaches have a certain dependable series of imbalances of the muscles that attach to the human skull. These muscles also control craniosacral movement in the skull and sutural dysfunctions in the skull. Correction of the cranial faults ameliorates both the problem found, the weakness in the manual muscle test that, of the muscles that attach to the skull, and in the clinical condition, headache. So uh, in applied kinesiology, a system of uh, cranial treatment, we use the manual muscle test to diagnose specific impairments of the muscles that attach to the head. It's quite possible that the cranial respiratory impulse, the craniosacral primary respiratory mechanism, is driven by something outside the nervous system. The contractile elements of the nervous system and the production of cerebrospinal fluid may not be enough to move the dura and the membranes and the cerebrospinal fluid. And so is it possible that muscles may need to be considered, especially the ones that attach to the head, neck, and jaw, in people with cranial dysfunctions? So why examine the muscles that attach to the head? <coughs> First of all, there's a direct uh, bridge between the muscle system and the dura. We all know about the study of HACK, and it's been confirmed by another, another, a number of other researchers. Uh, there are so many muscles that attach to the human head. We study the skull as a plastic model or a, uh, a sample, which you can't buy anymore, but uh, we always look at it without muscle attachments, and it's critical, really, when you assess movement of cranial sutures and cranial malfunction that you at least assess the muscle system. And as I said, it may be that the most likely source of the cranial rhythmic impulse is the muscle systems pulling and pushing on the human skull. We all know in SOT that the category two is profoundly influenced by many other muscles. Uh, Dr. Knudsen and many others have studied this and it's clear that some of the motion, uh, excuse me, motion of uh, nutation and others occur because of muscle function. So we say in applied kinesiology and other uh, cranial systems that it's important to consider muscle function when you consider a patient with cranial malfunctions. And so is it necessary to correct muscular dysfunctions before you try to release 
a suture? Does it make any sense? The temporalis muscle, for instance, has a profound effect on the bite and the TMJ mechanisms. There's the dry skull, and the actual thing you're dealing with is the human being that surrounds the suture, and that may need to be assessed. So, 52 patients were retrospectively examined their files who had headaches and cranial dysfunctions. The physical tests developed in applied kinesiology for the assessment of cervical muscle and cranial dysfunctions were assessed, and if they were positive, an indication was present. Um, the stomatic gnathic system was given treatment. The muscle tests that were most easily used were the deep neck flexor manual muscle test in all 52 patients. Um, it's interesting, the deep neck flexor MMT is considered by the International Headache Classification Committee to be uh, the most important diagnostic phenomena in patients with headaches. It's important that we know about this muscle in patients who have headaches. The sternocleidomastoid, the anterior scalene, and the upper trapezius manual muscle tests were also employed in all cases. The manual muscle test of the psoas muscle is the following. That goes very weak. Good. And we find in applied kinesiology that when there is an upper cervical malfunction, the muscle will be weak bilaterally on a dependable basis, and then when the patient does the following, it'll change that. Don, put your hands at the top of your neck, touch right where the bone of the skull and the neck meet. Good. Lift this up. Hold it here. Don't let me push. And that causes an immediate strengthening of the clinical prediction rule, making this a diagnostic clinical prediction rule for upper cervical malfunction. Interestingly, 52 of these patients also had a comorbid upper cervical subluxation or fixation, which also required treatment even after the cranial dysfunctions were removed. 39 of these patients also had positive challenges indicating temporomandibular joint dysfunction. All of us who work in the cranium know that cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6, 11, 5, and 7, they all kind of interact. And in any patient with a cranial dysfunction, if you look or know how to look for cranial nerve involvement, you'll find much more than just one uh, involved. And so uh, these cases had uh, upper cervical and uh, TMJ malfunctions. So the details were 49 patients had cranial dysfunctions that when corrected improved all or a portion of the muscle inhibitions that were comorbid with their headache. Three patients did not have cranial dysfunctions but had upper cervical and or TMJ dysfunction as a primary cause of their headache. 42 patients had SCM weakness, 33 uh, had deep neck flexor weakness, 24 patients with headache and cranial dysfunction had anterior scaling weakness, 24 patients had um, inhibition of the upper trapezius muscles, and three patients had no muscle inhibition comorbid, comorbid with their headaches. 24 patients also had uh, involvement of cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. In our mind, the ocular lock test in applied kinesiology was used to determine this. A patient looks into the direction where a saccadic motion occurs or in a field of vision that creates muscle weakness. And uh, correction of that was done in each case by a lateral sphenoid strain correction where the eye muscles all but one attach. Correction of this particular misalignment um, corrected this phenomenon in these patients. The clinical prediction rule for craniosacral dysfunction in applied kinesiology relates to the muscle system. The muscles that attach to the human skull are very strong. The strongest muscle in the neck is the sternocleidomastoid and the upper trapezius. In applied kinesiology, we specifically test these in patients whom we suspect have cranial fall. In applied kinesiology, the manual muscle test in relationship to cranial malfunction is also related to predicting outcomes of treatment. In this case, when the left temporal bone is pulled slightly forward and slightly lateral, lift your head up, turn right, hold the head up, 
there's a good strengthening of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Incidentally, there was the strengthening of the upper trapezius muscle, which we did not test in this picture. But uh, the uh, approach that we use predicts outcomes of treatment to the clinical prediction rule and to the cranial dysfunction associated with the headache. Patients who have the appropriate cranial treatment have the, an improvement in their headache picture. So, is it possible to have a new clinical prediction rule for patients with headache and cranial dysfunction? Can we make cranial malfunctions more apparent to both our patients and to the wider scientific community? Here's an impairment that seems to always go with a cranial dysfunction that is used by many, many out there, neurologists, physical therapists, the muscle test. In the treatment of these patients, the average initial VAS of uh, neck and associated pain for the 52 patients was 6.75. After treatment, averaging one to five sessions, the average VAS was reduced to 0.49, apparently effective treatment. So is the manual muscle test for uh, a useful CPR for headache and cranial dysfunctions? It, it, the muscle test does identify a functional disorder inhibition of the motor system of the head, neck, and jaw. The CPR is immediately followed by a sensory motor assessment, challenge, or therapy localization, which improves the inhibition found. Manual treatment is given and the muscle inhibition is corrected. <coughs> this may remove circularity from a chiropractic clinical prediction rule now aimed toward the immediate detectable causes of a specific condition. An update of all of this uh, evidence base for applied kinesiology has just been produced uh, by myself and a number of co-authors, including my former partner, Dr. David Walder, uh, in two new applied kinesiology textbooks. And that is my paper. Thank you very much. <laughs>